I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also extend my respects to any Elders joining us here today. Hi, my name is Cathy and I'm pleased to welcome our local history librarian, Jeff Potter, to present on the Milligan's connection with Woiwoi. Jeff has compiled quite a lot of the Milligan family history, including rare family images and memorabilia donated by the Milligan family themselves. This history forms the basis of a permanent display and exhibition space at Woiwoi Library, at the moment which is closed due to current COVID-19 restrictions and hopefully will reopen again soon. In the meantime, we welcome Jeff to present the Milligans of Woiwoi. Thank you for joining me this morning and Cathy, we'll, um, we will not uh, keep you waiting any longer. We'll launch right into it. So I hope you enjoy this and, um, and uh, I hope, I really do hope you enjoy it. So thank you. In this presentation, you will learn about the amazing, eccentric family of late comedian Terence Spike Milligan. Many people in recent years have wondered what the Milligan connection to Woi Woi was all about. Many have mistakenly believed that Spike and his family had little to do with Woi Woi, or even worse, disliked the place. I hope to convince you otherwise. And by the time I'm finished, I hope I think you might embrace the idea that the Milligan connection is definitely worth remembering and celebrating. Leo Alphonse Milligan was born in Sligo, Ireland in 1890 to a military family. Leo joined the army in London in 1904 at the age of 14. He discovered the theatre as an escape from a dreary and impoverished boyhood. As a child, he appeared with an up-and-coming comic called Charlie Chaplin. By 1907, he was writing, producing and appearing in what he termed gaffes, theatrical entertainments put on for tea parties and fellow barracks soldiers. Appearing under the name Leo Gann, Leo would sing romantic or comic numbers, often written by himself, such as Kate, Won't You Roll a Skate? and Cindy, You're My Dream. In 1911, the young soldier was sent on a rough horse, a rough horse riding course, which encouraged a lifelong fascination with horses. He became entranced with the images of cowboys, Indians and the Wild West that flickered across the silence film screens. Leo trained at a dancing and drama school around this time. While on leave in 1911, Leo Gann landed a two-week contract with the Imperial Palace Theatre in London. Later that year, he was transferred to India. In March 1914, Leo married Florence Mary Kettleband at Kirkie, India. Florence was born to a military family in Woolwich, England in 1893. Following service in the Boer War, Florence's father, Alfred, was posted to India and the family followed. The Milligan family story was played out against the backdrop of British India with all its pomp, pageantry and contradictions. The Milligans saw the British Raj at its zenith and its gradual decline as Indian nationalism and economic pragmatism eroded the prestige of a colonial empire in the 1920s and 30s. In 1912, Florence was playing organ and choir singing in a church at Kirki, India, when Leo Alphonse Milligan first heard her. He fell in love instantly with her trained contralto voice. On their wedding night, the pair performed a concert together in Bombay. As a married couple with plenty of servants, they found that they had plenty of spare time to indulge their interest in the theatre.
The Milligans performed in many army camps and regional theatres in India. Mrs Florence Milligan joined Leo on stage as Gwenny Gordon. During their long delayed Bombay honeymoon, Leo and Flo performed professionally for two weeks. By this time, Leo added skipping rope dancer to his many skills. You may note the name Leo Gan on the playbill towards the bottom there. Leo Milligan was too, too long a name to appear in anything but the smallest font on playbills. So by shortening his name, he was more easily noticed in publicity. This is an example of a, an early program from India featuring the Milligans. BQMS or Battery Quartermaster Sergeant LA Milligan uh, is shown, uh, he has said that he will sing and sing, talk and dance. Mrs. Eileen Kettleband, who was Florence's sister, sings of the wishing moon and will dance if she gets moonstruck. Mrs. L.A. Milligan will do many things to amuse you, but you must ask her. And then um, in the program, it lists a comedy, comedy stunt, fun around the sentry box. Officer Mrs. L.A. Milligan, uh, the officer was Mrs. L.A. Milligan. The private was BQMS L.A. Milligan. And the scene was any old time, any old place. And um, you can see the photograph there showing uh, a scene from uh, fun around the sentry box there. And of course, the evening ended with God save the King Emperor. Now looking at these images, one begins to realize that Sun Spike's talents and humor might owe something to the theatricality of his parents. Florence and Leo not only performed regularly together on stage, but also in Wild West trick riding shows at Army Jim Carners. Some shows included elaborate enactments of stagecoach holdups. This is all in the middle of India. Both Leo and Florence were highly skilled horse riders. Leo could pick up a handkerchief from the ground, riding at full tilt. These amazing images were taken in Pune. Leo was posted to Ahmednagar in India, a remote and dusty military station northeast of Bombay, which is now Mumbai. The station was a remount post for the British. Uh, an Australian connection is that the whaler horses from Australia were kept there. Um, it was here that Terence Allen Milligan was born on the 16th of April, 1918. Now, these images show the rather pampered existence of a child of the British Raj. The little boy there is Spike or Terence, always Terry to his family. And, um, you know, no doubt the servants built all these toys for him. Uh, quite a remarkable childhood, really. This next photo is what they call Chota Hazri, which is little breakfast or a light meal taken early in the morning. Um, Leo Milligan's rank as an officer in the British Army was not high up, but the family could live very comfortably indeed on the money that they had. Uh, Terence, in some of his poetry written as an adult, recognised the devotion and servant, service given by the many servants and wondered at the cost to those servants personally. He also mentioned that he wasn't surprised that the Indians were glad to see the British go from India. Here is a photograph showing Leo, Terence, always Terence or Terry to his family, even when he became known as Spike to the rest of the world, and Florence during a hunting trip. There are many family photographs of camping, shooting, skinning animals. Both Leo and Florence were very handy with a gun and, an ex and, um, and were both excellent shots with handguns and rifles. In later life, Terence came to regret the toll taken on the environment by hunters 
that as a child and given the place and time, this was the world they inhabited. Early in 1925, Leo was posted to Burma and took the family with him. It was a time of great racially fueled unrest in Burma and the family had many adventures during this time. Also during this time, Leo continued his um, theatrical endeavors, not as much as in India, but he actually appeared as a villain in a homemade silent Western, which unfortunately does not appear to have survived. Now this photograph shows the Milligan house in the cantonment in Rangoon. Um, it was almost like a gated community, I suppose, for army, uh, army soldiers, officers. You can see that they led very comfortable lives. The little boy in the photograph on the top uh, right hand side there in the pith helmet is uh, Desmond Patrick Milligan, Spike's younger brother. Uh, you can see here on the left that um, Terry or Terence is getting a haircut from a visiting barber. There were wallers or servants for laundry, for cooking, for working fans, for practically anything. There were hawkers who bought um, goods for sale. And um, it was indeed a privileged lifestyle for the British. Now, on 3rd of December, 1925, Desmond Patrick Milligan was born in the military hospital in Rangoon. An example of how over the top Leo could be uh, can be seen in the photograph taken of Desmond on the right. Now, for one short opening number in a school entertainment program, Leo kitted out not only Desmond, but the entire school boys in costumes, in soldiers' costumes like that shown. Not only did he do that, but he also drilled the boys so that they could march like real soldiers. And if you look at the photograph, it's no wonder that Desmond looks a bit over it all in that photograph. Now, the, the boys had in Burma a boys' own life. Um, you can see here that this is uh, visiting snake charmers on the, uh, the tennis court at the cantonment. Um, you can see a young uh, Terence Milligan, Spike Milligan, on the left-hand side uh, in, in a pith helmet there. Um, a lot of the photos show that he was quite a sort of tall, gangly sort of youth. Um, Leo again, was very over the top in indulging his son's um, interests and fun. Uh, he actually, uh, this is a, a real German machine, submachine gun that was a, um, it was a captured German machine gun that was sitting out the front of the barracks in Rangoon. And Leo thought, oh, that'll be good for the boys. And um, he took it home. And of course, they played soldiers uh, in the jungles with their um, real machine gun, not loaded, of course. Mind you, the boys were all very good shots. Now, this is um, what was called by Spike or Terence, the Lamanian army. And this consisted of Terence and Desmond and some of the local army, um, British army uh, sons of soldiers, but also servants, uh, children. And they used to run around the jungle and, and uh, basically play soldiers. And um, they were all kitted out with, <laughs> with guns and it was quite a remarkable uh, life. But of course, all that was to come to an end uh, eventually, and it was quite jarring for the family. Now, in 1933, Leo was discharged from the army owing to reductions in staff numbers. 
the family returned to England, a move which none relished after their charmed life of large houses, servants and freedom in India and Burma. Back in depression era London, Leo found it hard to adjust and he was unemployed for six months. The family rented rooms in Catford. The weather was cold and miserable. Leo landed a job selling photographs to magazines for American Associated Press. He worked 10 to 14 hour days, even on weekends for very poor wages. Eventually a larger house was found for the family and Leo's wages and promotion to photo sales manager improved matters and things began to look up a bit for the Milligans. In the early 1930s, the family moved to London, of course, as we've just discussed. This came as a blow to Terence and younger brother Desmond, who had previously lived a life of great freedom and adventure. The turbulent Europe of the 1930s found expression in the boyhood games and art of the brothers, uh, whereas previously the, the boys played soldiers in the jungles of Burma, um, Terence and Desmond uh, turned to sketching uh, endlessly the armies, navies and air forces of that imaginary country, Lamania, um, that uh, was so dear to them in Burma. As war grew closer, of course, the boys' imagery grew increasingly darker. Uh, at the top on the right-hand side there, you can see um, Terence as a young man and below him is uh, Desmond uh, as probably a, I guess a 12 or 13 year old. Now, around 1934, Terence found that he could imitate Bing Crosby exceptionally well. And he started singing with bands. He learned to play double bass, but of course, Terence being Terence wanted to make a much bigger noise. So a girlfriend eventually gave Terence money for his very first trumpet, which led to a lifelong interest in, uh, in those instruments. After a series of menial jobs and many band gigs, Terence was called up for military service in 1940. In 1942, he underwent artillery training. He took his trumpet and soon met up with like-minded jazz fans. Forming a band, Terence and friends played various dances and balls with a limited re repertoire. In 1943, Terence was in action in Tunisia and later Salerno. At Mount Damiano, Terence was caught in a hail of enemy fire, wounded and badly shell shocked. He spent a long time recovering in hospital and the after effects of the shell shock and his treatment contributed to chronic bouts of depression, which he suffered for the rest of his life. Downgraded as a result of this, Terence joined the ENSA concert party to make use of his musical talents and entertain troops. While part of the ENSA group, he met fellow performer, Harry Seacombe. From playing in a serious band, Terence graduated to playing in a slapstick comedy team called the Bill Hall Trio. The photograph there shows the Bill Hall Trio on the right. Now, by the mid 1940s, Terence the performer was becoming known as Spike Milligan, named after the US comedic bandman, Spike Jones. Now, in 1944, younger brother Desmond joined the army. He served in Bren carrier units. He saw very fierce fighting in the latter part of the war, including facing Panzer tank battalions in the Bloody Reichswall campaign in early 1945. Now, anyone listening in today would no doubt know about the Goon Show and uh, its effect on comedy. But um, post-war, the Bill Hall Trio continued playing for combined services entertainment for a short period. The trio disbanded and Terence decided to go solo. Through contacts at the Grafton Arms Hotel, Westminster, Spike landed a radio gig and wrote sketches and jokes for other comedians. 
who he didn't think were very funny. Working occasionally with Harry Seacombe, Milligan was introduced in 1949 to Peter Sellers. Peter did impressions and his abstract thought patterns helped cement a long lasting friendship with Spike. They began to experiment with funny voices and tape speeds, leading to many innovative sound effects later used to good effect in The Goon Show. An innovator at the BBC, Pat Dixon noted that, noticed the friends' talents and gave them the opportunity to record a pilot radio program. On 28th of May, 1951, The Crazy People was broadcast in the UK. The audience didn't understand the script, but the musicians, the backing musicians absolutely loved it. The show was renamed The Goon Show in its second season. Now, The Goon Show ran for 10 series until 1960. Its influence on post-war comedy has been far-reaching. The Monty Python team and Eddie Izzard cite the goons as major influences. Now, in the rare photograph that you see here, Eric Sykes, who was Spike's long-time business and entertainment partner, sits in the right foreground in front of Peter Sellers on the right, Harry Seacombe next to him, and, of course, Spike standing tall above Harry Seacombe. Now, in early November 1951, Leo and Florence, tired of austerity Britain, food shortages, petrol shortages, etc., left England on the SS Esperance Bay. Now, Spike was really put out, as brother Desmond also decided to make a life in Australia, and they all left Spike behind. Now, uh, on arrival in Australia, Leo and Flo, lived in various Sydney locations before finally purchasing a house at Orange Grove near Woi Woi around 1954. To help make ends meet, Florence worked on a production line in the email white goods factory. This is before email was something that you sent to people. This was uh, the old uh, washing machines and, um, and ringers and such. So, um, even though Florence had been a memsab in India and uh, had, um, you know, multiple servants and what have you, uh, she wasn't afraid to work hard when the family needed her to do so. That helped them survive a little bit uh, while they got established in Australia. The photograph that you see there is uh, of Orange Grove about the time that the Milligans first settled there in uh, the 1950s. Now, the comedy career of elder son Terence, known as Spike, began to take off in England around the same time that uh, his parents came out to Australia. Now, Spike, Spike taking time out to recharge his batteries after gruelling radio script writing and performing stints, visited his parents in 1958, and he absolutely fell in love with picturesque Woi Woi. In the late 1950s, Spike was commissioned by the ABC to write an Australian version of the BBC Radio Goon Show called The Idiot Weekly. Idiot Weekly was written for Australian audiences often mentioning Australian current events and characters. Many of the plots and gags drew on earlier goon show material, such as the dreaded Lurgy. Uh, there were numerous references to Woi Woi in these programs. One show was even called The First Australian Into Outer Woi Woi. The cast of Idiot Weekly included long-term collaborator John Bluthel, as well as Michael Eisdell, John Hewitt, Ray Barrett, Bobby Lim and Michael Carver. As with recent cuts to the ABC budget, the Idiot Weekly references to the poor state of ABC finances, such as this is the ABC and the roof leaks. Spike featured Woi Woi 
in a Sydney Morning Herald satirical article from October 1959 called Goon Fishing. Herald artist and Spike's younger brother Desmond illustrated the article under the moniker Patrick Milligan. And the article goes a little like this. There is somewhere in the steaming bush of Australia, a waterside town called Woi Woi. Woi, it is called Woi Woi. Woi will never know. It was founded 2000 years ago by the lyric Roman poet Terence, but gained no favour until Australians landed there in 1787 with Captain Fred Cook, the then leading agent of Cook's tours. These tours were steadily gaining favour with rich convicts who took the waters of the Woi Woi Hotel in preference to the penal settlement that charged them 10 bob a night for bed, breakfast and hanging. Nowadays, the old prison has been turned into a first class hotel with a service that any Michelin guide would be only too pleased to condemn. In, Le in England, Leo had started writing magazine articles as a source of income. At Woi Woi, he turned his interest in guns, horses and the Wild West into a small but enjoyable source of income, writing and publishing over 500 articles for various magazines, equestrian magazines, camping, uh, gun magazines, all kinds of, all kinds of publications. He even tried his hand at writing about Australian bushrangers, though his love of fantasy far outweighed the historically, historical ac accuracy of his work. Spike had a small study built at the back of the house, which he shared with his father as a writing studio. So you can see Leo there. Um, his sanctuary. It was, it was made to look like a Wild West cabin, and uh, and you'll see some of the uh, some of the guns hanging up. And uh, Leo had a, a massive gun collection, which unfortunately he, as he got older, he had to he couldn't get his license, and uh, for all these antique guns, and ended up having to sell uh, the most most if not all of them. The walls were adorned with items from Leo's gun collection and shelves groaned under the weight of old books, found items and family memorabilia. Now Spike wrote several books, including Silly Verse for Kids, Pakun, and his famous war memoir, Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall, at the Orange Grove Road home of his parents. Woi Woi became known to the outside world through Spike's comedy. Woi Woi was mentioned in Spike's Australian made radio and television shows, such as the Idiot Weekly that we've discussed previously. Letters sent to his mother were reproduced in his book, along with her home address in much simpler and safer times when it was obviously felt that stalkers were not a problem. According to Laura, Spike's daughter, her grandmother, Flo, kept a loaded shotgun behind the door just in case there was any trouble. An early television bank commercial featured Spike mentioning his mother and exclaiming, she lives at Woi Woi, you know. Uh, on the screen there, you'll see uh, in no, that uh, the photographs here were taken in 1959 for an ABC Weekly magazine article on Spike and Woi Woi. This was about the time of the release of Idiot Weekly. Uh, the kitchen that you see there on the right pretty much remained the same right through the whole history of the house. Uh, fortunately, before the family sold the property, we were able to photograph, um, photograph the old uh, Milligan house quite extensively. So, uh, but it didn't change much. Far from a superficial interest in the Woi Woi area, Spike developed a deep love and interest in the area. Uh, over time, he was to make enduring friendships with many locals. 
On his visit, Spike would wander around the bush on Blackwall Mountain and over at Daly's Point and poke around old houses in the area looking for interesting relics. Spike found Aboriginal rock carvings and Aboriginal history fascinating. Here he is pictured in the early 1960s with his second wife, Patricia, or Paddy Ridgway, who was a talented singer and actress in her own right. Leo gave talks locally to lions and rotary groups on Wild West subjects, often dressed in his authentic cowboy gear. He would also spin some very good yarns about his background to an audience who would not have known that they were being had. Leo died in early 1969. He's buried in the Catholic section of Point Clare Cemetery and is also commemorated on the walls of the Woi Woi War Memorial Park. The Woi Woi Herald at the time noted the passing of one of the district's most colourful and respected citizens. Florence Milligan throughout her life had never been afraid to grasp any opportunities that came her way. Florence was acutely aware that her son's fame gave her a public profile and she was courted by local politicians, community groups and the media, making numerous appearances in print, on television, uh, in a range of, of media throughout the, the uh, 70s and into the 80s. She helped in local conservation activism and charity work. Now in 1976, Florence was even su was surprised with her own This Is Your Life program. Uh, of course, Spike being Spike couldn't help but steal the show, I think. So uh, you'll see from that photograph. Always immaculately dressed, Flo Milligan could often be seen on shopping trips to Woi Woi. Her occasionally imperious Mem Sahib manner did not always go down well in Woi Woi, but she enjoyed the support and friendship of many of her Blackwall neighbours. Flo was a keen supporter of ex-servicemen's groups and for many years marched in Anzac Day parades in Woi Woi. There she is, uh, third from the right there. Now, the Queen of the Central Coast, Florence Milligan, died on 4th of July 1990 and is buried in the Catholic section of Point Clare Cemetery next to her husband, Leo. Now, you might ask what happened to Desmond. Desmond was a very talented man in his own right who was active in art and theatrical circ circles all his adult life. He lived in Sydney for much of his life uh, around Eastwood. He worked as a designer for Australian glass manufacturers when he first came out um, doing sort of sandblasted uh, artistic panels. Uh, but he found that the uh, he, he sort of saw the writing on the wall when uh, other workers got silicosis, so he got out of that. And then from 1956, Desmond worked for Fairfax and Sons, uh, rising to the position of director of the art department of the Sun newspaper. Desmond loved painting and was involved in early experimental theatre companies. He would often speak to community groups about Spike and his family. Desmond used a large black garage at the Blackwall property as his studio. Here Desmond is shown uh, with his portrait of the late Barry Cohen, which we actually have in the library collection and it's massive. Now, yes, Spike did say it. Sometimes Spike's comedy rankled local sensibilities. Locals have never quite forgotten his quip that woi woi, was the largest above ground cemetery in the world. What people do not realise is that this line was part of his act and it was repeated at many of his performances but changed to fit wherever he was playing at the time. Uh, unfortunately, it's only Woi Woi that took offence and remembers it. He's often, often and unfairly derided for this. Spike kept his lo many local good works very low key. He was perhaps his own worst enemy in this regard, as very few people ever knew the very positive effect that he had on the district. 
And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of that. So in 1959, shortly after Spike's first visit to the area, uh, Spike developed an interest in the poetry of Henry Kendall and his connection to the local area. So in 1959, Spike convinced Sir Charles Moses, head of the ABC, to air a half hour television national appeal to save Henry Kendall Cottage at West Gosford. Now, the Brisbane Water Historical Society had been attempting to raise money to save the cottage for a while without too much success. But Spike's work uh, on this documentary, and he appeared in it with his father, and uh, it was sort of showing local scenes, and um, it showed, uh, it had Spike and Leo doing voiceovers of Henry Kendall's poetry, etc. Um, this is all from a newspaper description, unfortunately. It doesn't appear to have survived. But um, this helped raise the profile of the appeal for Henry Kendall Cottage. And, of course, if you go over to West Gosford today, you'll see that Henry, Cottage, Henry Kendall Cottage is still there, not solely because of Spike, but, but his involvement certainly would have helped. So Spike spoke passionately about Henry Kendall and his place in Australian history and the need to preserve this house. This photograph shows Spike and Paddy and um, the lady on the, uh, on the, to the left of Paddy is um, uh, Desmond's wife, uh, Nadia. Um, and, uh, but this is at Henry Kendall Cottage in the early days. So the appeal helped the fledgling Brisbane Water Historical Society to collect preservation sun, funds. And of course, today, the building, Curranbeen, still operates as a museum. Now, in the late 1950s, uh, Spike purchased some blocks, bush blocks of land on Blackwall Mountain behind his parents' home. One day, he walked into the council offices at Gosford in Man Street. On the condition of anonymity, he donated the blocks to the Gosfordshire Council for addition to Blackwall Mountain Reserve. And of course, unfortunately now, it's not anonymous because um, a very good source actually, uh, who used to work for council told me that. And um, so, but again, Spike did a lot of good, but he didn't tell anybody, wasn't interested in big noting himself. Um, so a lot of this remained unknown. Together with local heritage campaigner and friend Beryl Strong, Spike saved the former Blackwall Church of England from demolition. In characteristic Spike style, he referred to the building in letters as Woi Woi's Westminster Abbey. This former church survives and now operates as an environmental heritage centre. Spike lent his name to numerous local environmental causes, including the saving of Riley's Island from development in the 1970s. Hooker Rex had intended that both St Hubert's Island and Riley's Island would be developed as canal estates due to the high level of community resistance with Spike acting as a well-known and highly recognisable voice of protest. In the end, only St Hubert's Island was developed. Apart from his role in helping protect Riley's Island locally, which is now a bird reserve, Spike, and Spike was friends with many Australian environmentalists, such as Jack Monday, um, and took a keen interest in the fight against the proposed Gordon Below Franklin Dam. Now, in the early 1960s, Spike wrote to Gosford Council several times, and I think he sort of had a pretty poor idea what a council actually did. But he wrote to council several times indicating his intention to live in the area, even asking council to suggest suitable locations for the building of a modern villa in a bushland setting, where he intended to write about Aboriginal history. Uh, basically, he was talking retirement and um, at that stage in 1960, he was probably pretty burnt out after all the goon show years. He was paid a pittance for writing the goon show. 
and it was high pressure work. And um, he basically was, was looking towards retirement at that stage. He did purchase land on what is today Ugari Drive at Daly's Point, but he never built on it. The area where he purchased uh, the land had absolutely magnificent views of Brisbane water. Spikes craved solitude and saw that the Woi Woi area was the place where he could enjoy this. His visits to the district, when he often said something outrageous, were e eagerly reported in local newspapers. But mainly Spike just wanted to enjoy his time with his family. Woi Woi was a refuge for Spike in difficult times. It also gave him clear air in which to write for radio, books and television. Following the deaths of their parents, Spike and Desmond retained ownership of the house. Following Spike's death in 2002, Desmond eventually decided to sell the Milligan family home in Orange Grove Road in 2009. The house still stands. It is a private residence, so please don't go and visit. Um, it has been much altered to make it a, a more modern home. Having resided in the East, Eastwood area for much of his adult life, Desmond died in May 2017 at the age of 91 years. So Spike Milligan, as you probably know, was declared state, stateless by the British government in 1962. Spike became an Irish citizen, but the world famous comedian said that Woi Woi was the closest place to home he ever knew. He once said, in 1950, my parents emigrated here. I thought they were mad. Then I came out to see them and I went mad. I fell in love with the place. After Spike died in 2002, his chosen epitaph was written in Gaelic on his headstone in Winchelsea Cemetery in England. It is possibly the most ex memorable example written and says a lot about Spike's gifts of, gift of humour. I told you I was ill. Now, in recent years at Woi Woi Library, we've opened a uh, permanent exhibition celebrating the Milligan connection to Woi Woi. It consists of displays reflecting the fascinating life of the Milligan family. Uh, there's a small theaterette where you can watch examples of Spike's work, and there's even a short film which was made specially for the theaterette, and you can only see there, which is called The Milligans of Woi Woi. Um, and uh, that actually involves um, Laura, Laura Milligan, uh, Spike's daughter, and um, uh, Michael Milligan, uh, Desmond's son, and, uh, and also includes a little bit of uh, footage from Desmond describing his life. So, um, of course, with COVID, it's closed to the public at the moment, but when it does reopen, we would really love you to come and have a look at it and um and uh you know it, it's uh we're very proud of it and we it we think it reflects quite honestly and accurately and lovingly i suppose the milligan connection to woi woi which is much deeper than a lot of people have uh, realized so on that note i'd like to thank you for your attention and um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'll see if I can answer them. I can see Lindsay's popped something in the, the chat box. Um, Lindsay, you must have gone to see the exhibition space because she says it's a fab fabulous display collection and a wonderful find in the library. Everyone must go and enjoy this. So highly recommended from Lindsay there. Thank you, Lindsay. That's great. It's um, a lot of a lot of work, hard work, and a lot of um, it was a lot of fun to put together. And we were very lucky to have um, amazing cooperation from Desmond Milligan and his son Michael, and also Laura Milligan that I've mentioned. And um, without their help and without the memorabilia that the family donated, uh, particularly what had been by Florence Milligan over the years and kept it woi woi, um, 
we could not do a display like that. Um, what that is the tip of the iceberg. We have so much more material um, that's not on show, but we hope when we can to uh, rotate displays and do look at different themes. Aha, uh -huh, yes, uh, I can see from Andy, he's um, trumpet playing. Yes, all his life he, he loved trumpet playing. We actually have uh, Spike's cornet in the display uh, at Woi Woi that was loaned, it's on permanent loan from the family. And it's, it's interesting in its own right because it's this battered old instrument that's been sort of used to within an inch of its life. And then you get, uh, you look at the case and the case is so worn and beaten up. And on one part of the case, he's written, uh, Orm Street, London, which was the address of his office in London. And then on another part of the case, if you look carefully, it's got his other home, um, which was Orange Grove Road, Woi Woi. Jeff, do you want to explain? We've got this Milligan logo that's on a lot of our stuff. Oh, where did, where where did that come from? from? Okay. In, in the display at Woi Woi, um, actually found in a back shed at Eastwood after uh, Desmond Milligan died, um, was a packing case that the family, so the family held on to everything, like quite remarkable. I've often said to people that it was almost as if they knew they were going to be famous. Um, the amount of stuff that they held on to was remarkable. But out in this shed, was this black packing case, which had no doubt made, it looked like it had made the journey from Burma to uh, Burma to London, and then probably from London to uh, Australia in 1951. But on the side of it was written Milligan in a font that's actually very close to that branding that we've used. I think we're drawing to a conclusion and thank you very much for joining us everybody today and thank you Jeff for your time to no, share thank your you, everyone. Milligan expertise so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining in everyone. Bye-bye.